Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to this uh, TPA Global Webinar. This time, subject intercompany financing insights. We have the BEPS oriented, of course, but also uh, very applicable to these days during the crisis the period. Um, I'm uh, Yariv Bendov, advocate and economist of uh, YBD transfer pricing services in Israel and a member of uh, TPA Global. And uh, with me are Marina and Dana, senior associates at uh, TPA uh, Global. So uh, let's go uh, to the agenda. And uh, I will give a couple of words if we can go, yeah. So um, again, this webinar is basically the subject of intercompany finance. We will give uh, an insight about a couple of the very important subjects about intercompany finance. Um, but uh, before uh, we do that, we will touch uh, also transfer pricing in the COVID-19 uh, period of time, which is again what we are all facing uh, nowadays, corporation, individuals, uh, everybody. Certainly it has a certain effect on everybody, uh, life, businesses, tax, environment and everything. Um, so, uh, we will start uh, uh, with an introduction um, about uh, the impact uh, of OECD transfer pricing guidelines on financial transactions. This is something uh, that recently was approved. And then uh, we will touch transfer pricing consideration during and after a global crisis. Uh, this, these two subjects will be presented by uh, Marina and uh, by Dana. After Marina and Dana will finish with this, I will give my comments uh, to both uh, the crisis uh, period of transfer pricing and financial transaction. And then I will continue uh, about uh, methodological overview of uh, intercompany loans. Uh, we will touch types of corporate loans. Uh, we will talk about intercompany loans, key contractual principles. Uh, and we will see how to estimate the cost of debt of an intercompany loan. Then we'll come to part two, which is uh, the earnings stripping uh, the right way. We will talk about uh, the erosion, uh, the range of uh, the tax base uh, in the world today, which is basically subject of the BEPS uh, project, uh, but of course in the context of uh, the finance transaction. And we will give uh, two illustrative examples about intercompany and mezzanine loan and also about a certain factoring transaction. There's also, you will see in the presentation, a lot of tables, a lot of numbers. Uh, we will probably not get into all the details, columns, rows in the numbers, uh, but at least we'll talk about the example and try to understand the importance of them. And then we'll have the Q&A session. Uh, if anybody has a question, of course, uh, then uh, Marina will now, uh, Marina and Dana will explain all the technical aspects of it. Uh, and uh, that's it basically. I hope uh, you will have a very uh, effective and enjoyable uh, webinar. And Marina, I'm uh, heading that uh, to you right now. Thank you. Um, so just a, a few communications. Um, you have the right to raise your hand and to do questions. Um, uh, everybody's muted, but please feel free to raise questions in the questions box. We will we'll try to address them uh, at the moment. If not, we'll make sure we address them at the end of the presentation. And um, yeah, you can always communicate with us in the chat as well. Um, now I would just give the floor to Donna. She will give a brief introduction. Uh, hello. Uh, today I'm going to uh, briefly discuss the main consideration of the OECD report on financial transaction. Uh, the Committee on Fiscal Affairs OECD produced a non-consensus discussion draft on financial transactions in July 2018. The discussion draft aimed to clarify the application of the principles included in the 2017 edition of the OECD transfer pricing guidelines. Uh, in particular, the accurate delineation analysis under Chapter 1 to financial transactions. It also provided guidance with specific issues relating to the pricing of loans, cash pooling structures, financial guarantees, and captive insurance. The aim of the OECD initiative was to reduce 
uncertainty about the transfer pricing rules for financial transactions. After the invitation to provide comments on a discussion draft, more than 2,000 pages of public comments were received, as well as the criticism and concerns of taxpayers. In February uh, of this year, OECD released final transfer pricing guidance on financial transactions. Irrespective of many comments and fundamental issues raised by interested parties, comparing the non-consensus draft with this final report, the amount of differences is quite limited. Many TP professionals uh, express their concern that the new report will not reduce the risks faced by taxpayers. Uh, the fact that the OECD guidance is soft law that is open to interpretation means that tax administration may apply guidance in different ways. In April of 2019, the UN Committee of Experts on International Cooperation in Tax Matters also released a draft on, on financial transaction as an update to practical manual on transfer pricing for developing countries. Both the UN draft and OECD report provide guidance on the accurate delineation of the financial transaction based on the actual conduct of the parties and analysis of the economic relevant characteristics of the financial transaction. Slide two. Next slide. Uh, third. Yes. Uh, the OECD report uh, begins with guidance on how to accurately delineate financial transactions in line with the post debt transfer pricing principle within Chapter 1 of the OECD guidelines, necessary before pricing a financial transaction to determine if adjustments are required. The report refers to the commentary to Article 9 of the OECD Model Tax Convention, which notes that Article 9 is relevant not only in determining whether the rate of interest provided for in loan contract is an arm's length rate, but also whether prima facie loan can be regarded as a loan or should be regarded as some other kind of payment, in particular contribution to equity capital. The accurate delineation of the balance of debt and equity funding of a borrowing entity within a multinational group is addressed. However, the guidance does not mandate this as the only approach to determining whether debt should be respected as debt for transfer pricing purposes, nor is it intended to prevent other approaches to address debt equity balance and interest deductibility under country's domestic legislation. The alienation of financial transactions should begin with a thorough identification of economically relevant characteristics including an examination of the contractual terms, a fun functional analysis identifying the functions performed, asset use and risk assumed by the parties. The characteristics of the financial instruments, the wider economic circumstances of the parties and the market, and the business strategies of the parties and the wider group. Inaccurately delineating an advance of funds, Economical relevant characteristics may be useful indicators, depending on the facts and circumstances, such as the presence or absence of a fixed repayment date, the obligation to pay interest, the right to enforce payment of principal and interest, and other circumstances. Uh, to avoid uh, re-characterization of intercompany loans, taxpayers should be able to demonstrate cash flow analysis demonstrating borrower ability to repay, an overview of the terms of the loan, and if it appears to have debt-like characteristics, an overview of why a loan was structured in a certain way, and why unrated parties in a similar circumstances would have structured it this way, and the last one, a discussion of realistic alternatives, and why this was the best transaction for both the lender and borrower, to enter into relative to the available alternatives. The analysis provided by the OECD report is based on the assumption that the transactions are respected as loan 
pursuant to another delineation under Chapter 1 or domestic legislation. The report envisages the specific issues related to determining whether the rate of interest provided for in a loan contract is an arm's length rate. In particular, in determining an arm's length rate of interest on intra-group loans, the consideration should be given to both the lenders and borrowers' perspectives, use of credit ratings of the entity, multinational group, or the debt issuance to measure credit worthiness and identity, identify potential comparables, including various methodologies for performing credit rating analysis. Using publicly available tools or seeking to replicate the methodologies used by independent credit agencies, and the need to take both quantitative and qualitative factors into account. The effects of group membership and any associated implicit support, evaluation of covenants, availability of a guarantee. Each of these considerations may raise questions and uncertainties in practice as they might be subject to different interpretation. For example, uh, when analyzing the lender's perspective, one should determine whether the lender should make a loan, how much to lend, and on what terms, as well as other options realistically available to the lender. A taxpayer and tax authorities may take different interpretation and position on all these points. And that's all. And my colleague Marina will continue. Thank you, Donna. Yeah, so we heard Donna talking about the OECD released guidance of financial transactions. We can see that uh, we had a lot of criticism on it. Um, now I want to address uh, what's the impact of COVID-19 in the businesses and uh, what is the trans what can you do in the transfer pricing arena to ensure the liquidity. I think liquidity management is uh, the words they are pounding now in the heads of all corporates. So what can we do in the transfer pricing arena? Here at TPA, we created a assessment. It's basically a checklist that allows companies to go through specific points where we think uh, transfer pricing is gonna play a determining role on this, on overcoming this crisis. So we will start with the overall assessment. Here in the slides, you see uh, three checklist bullet points. So determining if these changes that are happening are temporary or permanent. So how they are gonna affect your business model and for how long. Uh, the second point is uh, very significant, very important. It's to keep your audit trail. So make sure you're documenting all the changes, in, all the changes and reasoning the changes appropriately. Because in the future, when uh, audits come, uh, when tax authorities come for questioning, we want to make sure that the documentation is there. Uh, the third bullet point is quantify the impact of the changes, including the cost. So try to, try, here we're, we can assist corporates in trying to quantify the impact of COVID-19 and the cost that you incurred on doing these changes. Uh, after all, after this just overall assessment, uh, we start more specific. So determining your group, your industry analysis. So what are your peers? Or what is the impact on your peers? How are your peers dealing with it? Uh, did it change the, the dynamic of the industry? Uh, is there a disruption on supply chain, for example? Is the cycle being uh, broken? So. Make sure you document your, in, your in industry appropriately during this period. Afterwards, you have your value chain and supply chain points. I think are uh, so very important. And when Donna was talking about the accurate delineation of the transaction, uh, I think COVID will play a huge role in changing this uh, paradigm in transfer pricing. So for example, uh, we need to assess here uh, how, how the supply chain disruptions uh, ch shift the value between the group companies. So our group companies is still providing the same value as before. Was there any shift of people, for example, due to the travel restrictions? Was there a shift in functions or risks? 
Um, if you take, for example, companies that are really characterized as routine or low risk, uh, is there any changes in that profile, in that transfer pricing profile of them? Uh, here we give an example in third bullet point. For example, the toll manufacturer's local management is changing the production capacity. So this is not passing to the principal anymore, but rather it's um, it's being changed locally. It could be that uh, some commercial commercially driven changes are changing a transfer pricing model. So uh, make sure that your transfer pricing model is being documented in a way that it's being justified by the commercially driven changes. Uh, it could also be that uh, intergroup goods are could be transferred at cost temporarily to reduce uh, potential losses in uh, distributors, for example, um, and to reduce cash and transfers, reduce custom duties. So um, here we talk also about the risk management and mitigation. That's the point on the local management. If you have a very centralized organization and um, for low risk distributors, tow manufacturers or consignment manufacturing, um, are this, uh, is there a shift in the change of this uh, management or is there a shift in the change of the risks? Um, is, is there an adjustment that needs to be made in the transfer pricing uh, model right now that could mitigate the impact of this? Okay. Um, I, we have a question here. Uh, can I choose a lower TNMM margin, but is still in the study range on 2020? Okay, I will address your question just further on. Uh, we are also going to talk about that, so about benchmarking and uh, price testing. Okay, so um, assessing your supply chain processes, if there are any changes in the intercompany relationship, for example, due to the some uh, blockages in countries, uh, the, there's a diversion of shipments that should uh, that would impact your supply chain. So uh, the third bullet point here in the next slides is about transfer pricing setting and checking. So that comes your question on the lower TNMM margin, uh, but it's still inside the study range. When it comes to benchmarking, we need to keep in mind that the public available data for comparables, it's not available in real time. So there's always going to be a time lag in testing and supporting positions taking. And uh, if uh, multinationals choose to apply the same CP policy that was before the pandemic to the pandemic period, it might be that it would be hard to for third-party comparables if the industry got negatively affected and if the independent peers are making losses and you keep applying the same CB policy, which makes your tested party not to be on losses, you need to keep in mind that. So for benchmarking, our, our, our assessment here is that uh, it's to assess if you would need any updates on the current benchmarking. So for example, already in hindsight, in, including comparables that have negative margins or just in the range, take into account uh, different, dynamics, uh, different dynamics from previous year. But if uh, you choose a lower TNM margin, but you're still in the study range, so you're still in the interquartile range, of 2020, that shouldn't be a problem. But if and so far you are updating benchmarks this year, uh, it would be wise uh, to to assess if you need any updates on the comparable set. Um, the third bullet point here in this slide is uh, year end CP adjustments uh, that would be required uh, to reallocate losses, for example. Um, and finally, uh, CPA's assessment is uh, on the intercompany agreement. So make sure that your legal setup is uh, covering these changes as well. So come back to your intercompany agreement. Make sure that um, is there. Uh, make sure that the force majeure clause uh, can support renegotiation of terms or even the termination of an agreement if necessary. And um, um, may see if there is an, any amendments that are necessary that need to be renegotiating terms and conditions on such a short notice and due to 
to a force majeure uh, period. Um, when it comes, we're talking here, of course, we're going to focus on intercompany financing. So uh, we're talking about liquidity, liquidity management. So it might be the existing loan arrangements, funding arrangements uh, need to be restructured or interest rates need to be repriced and adjust in line with third party uh, interest rates, which could be lower and uh, can help free up cash flow. So it might be as well the subsidiaries who need uh, new or even increasing um, loans and financial support. And this needs to take into account interest and debt limitation rules in many jurisdictions. So that's uh, a point to be considered. And of course, uh, we're holding taxes. Um, for the delineation of the transaction, again, good to stress about the, the functions and assets and risks and the management of it. Make sure that uh, debits versus equity considerations are taken into account. So um, if the group decides to proceed with debt, uh, there is a risk now that a loan will be considered as no arm's length arrangement and recharacterized as a contribution to equity. Um, so uh, it doesn't imply that borrowing is not possible in 2020. That's not, not what I'm trying to say. It's rather that you, you make sure that you have another trail that the borrower can be able to demonstrate that there's a reasonable expectation to return borrowed money. Um, further to that, talking about intercompany financing, um, I think uh, it's here is important that we keep we keep into take into account um the collateral uh that uh, an independent lender would demand for a loan uh and would not agree to give funds for much even for much higher interest rates so keeping the mind keeping in mind the lender's perspective here as well um credit rating was the point that uh, donna took over um it's so obviously the financial statements for 19 or even 18 uh, will not take into account the COVID-19 impact. And because of that, it can be that the actual credit rating of the borrower might be significantly different in 20 compared to 19, um, even if uh, financial results were consistent in previous year. So it might be that our correspondence adjustment is required in the credit rating of the borrower. So that's a, a few considerations that multinationals should take into account uh, when assessing COVID-19 impact, both during and post-COVID-19. Um, here at TPA, we have an extensive list of measures the government um, has taken uh, during COVID-19 period. I'll be happy to, to answer any further questions that you have on it. Uh, you can always uh, drop me an email as well. But um, now I'd like to open the floor to both of my colleagues, Don and Niyadev, if they have um, points on it, and also open the floor to the audience to make any questions that you deem necessary. Uh, Ghana, do you have any comments to that? Oh, I don't have. Okay. Um, if uh, we have question, uh, and Marina, I uh, suggest uh, we can hear them now. If otherwise, uh, we can continue. Um, so uh, I would like, yes, I, I have a few comments. I Basically, I mean, we heard so far, uh, uh, Dana talked about the OECD uh, uh, guidelines, uh, which entered into force about financial, into company financial transaction. And then uh, Marina discussed the transfer pricing in general. Uh, but getting uh, certainly into details uh, about uh, uh, the COVID-19 time. I would like to uh, take a few minutes uh, before we enter uh, the actual uh, loan examples, uh, just to discuss about that. And first to start about uh, generally intercompany finance, uh, which for quite a long time, uh, a lot of corporation, a lot of uh, companies treated intercompany finance, not in the way they treat it, for transfer pricing purposes, meaning reporting and documenting and making transfer pricing studies and even intercompany agreements, the way they were treating uh, like plastic transactions of, for example, selling goods, uh, services, 
royalties, uh, things like that. Um, and and true, uh, there was a time uh, when tax authorities uh, didn't pay much attention uh, to that. Um, and but that changed. That changed, and uh, there's no. Uh, and we see that uh, in uh, the OECD guidelines, and we see that in recently uh, increased tax audits around the world globally that uh, uh, taxpayers faces all the time now questions about uh, their financial transaction, their tax base, uh, the base erosion and profit shifting, of course. Um, and even in forms, uh, some countries today, when you're submitting your tax return, you have also to submit a form detailing your intercompany transaction. Um, so, so you, for example, you're saying, uh, you know, uh, the current company sell its good uh, uh, to its related party in the U.S. for continuing distribution. We're using CPM, uh, and uh, uh, there's R&D services using, uh, 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 again, uh, if it's in Europe, maybe the TNMM and, uh, and net cost plus as a profit level indicator. Uh, and so on and so on. But now we are also obliged for quite a time, also in these relevant countries, also to detail about intercompany finance. So uh, if I have an open balance with my subsidiary, I have to report that in many countries. Uh, if I have granted an intercompany loan or a capital note, or if I have a, a factoring transaction. So the world indeed has changed with intercompany uh, that's that's about that. Um, and coming back uh, to the very important stuff that uh, Marina described about uh, the COVID-19 time. Um, so I, I think the question here, because you know, uh, uh, we have so, so many legislation, we have the BEPS project, we have the OECD, we have the local countries. It's all about documenting, assessing, examining everything. And nobody was ready for the COVID-19 naturally. But as soon that came, uh, the question arise, and Marina, I think, uh, uh, talked about it very well. I would just like to comment and just to illustrate about that. So, uh, uh, first of all, um, we are at, you know, in, in, in the general uh, life cycle of transfer pricing. Uh, so, most of the time we have, you know, the IP holder, the entrepreneur, the risk taker, um, the function holder, and things like that. And then we have the lowest distributor or the routine service provider. I'm not talking about, of course, profit uh, split and things like that. And in these cases, we are, of course, and there was a question here about the TNMM targeting a certain operating margin, by the way. Uh, in this case, we're certainly, um, you know, we, we are leaving though these low risk distributor with a certain uh, low, relatively, relatively low operating uh, margin where all the residual is coming back uh, to the IP holder, uh, to the entrepreneur. And the question is whether, and this, this is actually has no, has no uh, relatively answer, but the question is whether uh, on, is already in 2020, where the COVID-19 started, um, and hopefully it will end soon, but the question is whether already in this tax year, the 2020, we should treat our uh, subsidiaries, our related parties, uh, uh, with the COVID-19 policy. And what is the COVID-19 uh, 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 policy? So, for example, uh, Marina uh, mentioned uh, benchmark, for example. So, we know that if we will enter, as Marina mentioned, a certain acceptable uh, database like the Standard & Poor or like uh, the Amadeus, Beru Van Dyke or whatever, <clears throat> or Financial Bloomberg, the comparables that, uh, that we will find there right now, and again, if we are measuring a certain arm's length uh, using a database, the arm lengths uh, our results are for today, the day we are measuring, because of course that's what you have, and that's what the tax authority has. So if we are testing now comparables, and of course there's no uh, there's no uh, affection in COVID-19 right now, because that will probably only will be reflected in the database in 2021 when these financial statements will appear, and I'm talking about U.S databases, because in European databases, that could also be in 2022. Um, and, and another question is, I think Marina raised uh, this topic, is what happened, um, you know, sometimes when we're doing a TNMM or CPM uh, for, for the U.S. analysis, uh, we are excluding company uh, that bears losses. 
because we're saying that's not our length, for example, or whatever reason, maybe we're excluding them for all three years, maybe we're excluding them only for one year. Um, but what's happened now? Because we know now that we don't have data that reflects in the databases the COVID-19, but we know exactly that the current environment, transfer pricing and industrial environment right now reflecting the COVID-19 era. So whether we should accept, for example, lose its company, company that bears loss. But if we are uh, getting a, we're accepting them, we should, of course, we have to explain, as Marina mentioned, the transfer pricing documentation. It's very important. It's very important that we keep a proper documentation and will not lose our transfer pricing policy. Because once the COVID-19 hopefully will be over, once it's over, then we will still have to face this transfer pricing audits and maybe also get uh, uh, back to normal. So another question about that is, uh, let's say uh, we are now uh, leaving the lowest distributor. There was a question about that with a very, very, let's say the lower quartile of the range and maybe even less than that because we are doing a certain change in the intercompany agreement, as was mentioned, um, and we're uh, even maybe a certain loss position, something that reflects and again should be explained 100% in the documentation, why are we doing that? So the question here is, uh, assuming uh, in two years, things will be again back to normal, hopefully of course much, much, much before, should we, for example, compensate the lowest distributor for the losses, losses years? Yes, no, that's again, that's a discussion and I don't think the tax authorities are 100% are well, uh, you know, ready for that because they are discussing in two. Um, and if we are going now to finance and we are combining finance in the time of the COVID-19, again, that was mentioned very well by Marina, we are saying, okay, so in a normal course of life, we had an intercompany loan agreement. Um, we determined an intercompany interest rate. We're gonna touch that in a minute. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, like the OECD suggested and also, uh, the use regulation, which will be discussed. Um, there's terms of payment. We know we have a loan agreement. We have an Excel showing where the payments will be made, where the interest will be paid. But if we are taking the COVID-19 right now, so obviously organization will be working with banks and also, of course, private people. Banks are, uh, you know, they are giving them a waiver on some of the loans. Uh, their negotiation, again, the business terms, um, and they are delaying the payment terms. So if that's the case, so that's the arm's length, right? Because this is what you're doing with third party. So again, as was mentioned, you should also probably do that with your related party if that's the case. So maybe uh, you can again assess uh, the interest rate in order to reflect uh, the change uh, of the, uh, you know, of the risk taker and the conditions. But again, the conclusion here, and I will end uh, uh, with that and then move on, is that, again, we have to work still 100% according to transfer pricing regulation and to assure that we have the proper documentation of all relevant intercompany transactions. We just need to adjust them and to give the economic ratios to the current COVID-19. Um, Marina, any question if we have about that? If not, I can move uh, to the next uh, slide. No, uh, just taking your point on the benchmarks and uh, the availability of data only on 2021 or 22, just now already in hindsight, I think it's important to assess if you can already do something in your current benchmarks. For example, if you're currently deleting companies that have uh, one, two, three years of losses, can you accept these companies if in so far they are comparable? So that's a point that you wouldn't have done so far because that was the approach of the benchmarks. But take into account that you need to, to take dynamics of uh, 2020 benchmarks where you are taking financial years from, I don't know, 15, 16. Can you accept companies that were in loss with them to make sure that even if they are comparable, you are taking a broader range in the industry and not only companies there um, that you would accept previously before COVID-19. So there is a certain form of updates that you can do in current benchmarks, even if we're talking about financial years that were four or five years ago. So you need to keep that in mind. Correct. Totally agree with that. 
Okay, do we have any more questions? Um, no, not so far. I think we can uh, okay, so move on. Uh, yes, of course, uh, again, I, there is a Q&A session uh, in the end of the presentation of the webinar, so uh, we can answer the question uh, also there. And of course, if uh, uh, attendees uh, would like also to then uh, uh, send uh, questions, uh, we will, and we will not have the time to answer, we of course will answer their uh, a question uh, through uh, the email and Marina will uh, explain that. Um, okay, we can continue. So the next uh, slide, please. All right. Um, so let's start uh, with talking uh, just about a couple of the important things about uh, intercompany loans, intercompany finance. First, let's start uh, very briefly. I will not read in everything and you know go everything uh, because of the time limit, but still. Um, we have a couple of corporate loans, uh, which basically includes the cash credit overdraft, uh, the working capital loan, uh, the facility loan. Uh, it's all explained here, of course. And we have also the factoring. Factoring is very important, and especially in these days, and even before the economic crisis, before the, because of the COVID-19, uh, was very, very uh, important. Um, what is actually a factoring? I think everybody knows that, but still, it's Let's talk about that. So factoring is an arrangement where a business sells all or selected accounts receivable uh, to a third party, which is the factor. This is the general factor, not an intercompany, at a price lower than the nominal uh, reasonable value of uh, those accounts, which is called the discount factor. Uh, and then we have the credit risk of non-payment by the debtor, which is borne by the business in cases of recourse terms. And if it's borne by the factor, it's a case of a non-recourse term. So uh, basically, we're talking about a situation um, when a certain company has account receivables, or in other words, a lot of clients, customers owe uh, owe uh, these uh, company uh, money. Um, but it takes time. It takes time. I've seen uh, many companies, uh, also very uh, big one in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, whereby. Uh, it has a lot of accounts receivable with millions, millions of dollars, uh, but time was the problem here, that the essence of factoring because the cash flow was a very huge problem. They didn't get cash, they just had very uh, large revenues in their PL. So in these cases, or even these companies, and of course, the much smaller companies are doing factoring transactions, which basically um, they are applying a factor company. And they're telling them, uh, we are selling these. We're selling you our, uh, you know, their account receivable. Um, you will pay us, uh, for example, right now, because we need the money, uh, the value of this receivable, but not, of course, the same value, less a certain amount, the discount factor, which in the end of the day, um, the, uh, uh, the factoring company uh, will earn about uh, this uh, 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 this delta between the price and what uh, they collect, and the debtor, the original debtor, will receive the money, a lower sum of money, sometimes much lower, but at a certain date, it will receive it. And we'll give an example about factoring because it's uh, very important. I would just like to talk about uh, the note there, uh, uh, which is under the factoring, about intercompany term of trade, intercompany trade receivable payables. Um, which is not necessarily only to factoring transaction, can trigger deemed debt symptoms um, uh, because sometimes, and that's another question, sometimes uh, we had a case, for example, uh, with the tax authorities, a very famous agriculture company that uh, uh, collected money from its third, the, the payment terms with its third parties was 90 days, payment 90 days, and the third parties indeed paid not later than 19 days. But when the tax authorities during the transfer pricing got it, examined the intercompany transaction, they found out that the intercompany paid their receivable is like something like two years, something like that. Uh, and the, the tax authorities in this case say, you know, that's not arm's length. You would never sign something because we have our information. For example, you would never sign something like that with a third party. So uh, we are not accepting two years, and not more than that, we are going to take the difference between 90 days and between two years, 
and we're going to give that a certain interest and we're going to give a tax, a tax assessment on that. So uh, intercompany terms of trade, what we call right now open balances, are also a very crucial part of intercompany loans today. The question, of course, right now is whether 90 days, which is very acceptable around the globe uh, for, let's say, a, uh, in certain arms length payment terms, what happened, of course, in the COVID-19 area? Because maybe right now, when this is so bad, maybe 90 days is a joke. Maybe even 120 days is something we should think about it. And again, as Marina talked and I also comment, maybe right now, uh, intercompany agreements about payment terms could be updated to the current situation and explain very good to the tax authorities and only when back to normal life, normal business life at least, we can change them back. So that's about open uh, balances. We can go to the next slide. All right. So um, we have M&A financing and the commonly used for M&A financing is what we call a mezzanine loan, uh, which is uh, typically a long-term loan that can be used as a replacement for equity investor capital. It's something like blends debt and equity, which is the advantage. We're going to give an example of that. Uh, it's important to remember that indeed mezzanine loans are highly flexible and customizable and allow the acquirer to defer the principal repayment of the loan until the back end of the investment where the cash flow of the business has materially increased. So that's the benefit for uh, the two parties, of course. And we have project finance, which also include, you know, for a certain uh, project we would like to finance it and then so there's a cash or instrument like a finance loan which is being granted uh, to the to the project holder and then the money is getting back according to terms of course when the project uh, is being get starting to generate the cash also syndicated loan where a group of people is doing that we can go uh, to the next slide Okay, so uh, what's happened here is uh, this is actually, uh, uh, Dana mentioned the OECD guidelines uh, and uh, uh, the new update there uh, to see uh, how to avoid actually recharacterization of intercompany loans taxpayers uh, if you want to uh, avoid them from equity from, uh, and to loan and to interest, uh, then you should be able to do the following and then uh, Dana gave a lot of example. I what we see here is actually something that is taken uh, from uh, Section 385 of the U.S. Uh, uh, tax uh, regulation, which basically this is a section. You know, it's, it's called a section, but it's uh, 100 pages, which addresses whether uh, a certain increments between related parties are treated uh, as debt. Uh, or equity. So that's very similar uh, to the OECD and we can see here a lot of uh, example uh, to see whether uh, we can call it debt or equity, um, but very detailed. Uh, you can see there's a lot of numbers here, uh, like, you know, the name of the financial instrument. How do we call it? Do we call it a loan? Do we call it a capital note? Uh, do we call it a guarantee? What, what's the actual name of it? Uh, what is the source of payment? What was the intent of the parties? There's a lot of here. Uh, what are the risks that involved? Uh, the contingency on the obligation, the provision of redemption by the corporation, the last more. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. And we can see here uh, also timing of the advance with reference to the organization of the corporation, for security for advances, and I will comment about that. Uh, you know, I will comment about that right now. Um, in the early stages, as I mentioned, of what we call an year to company finance in tax audits, what happened is that the tax auditor came uh, to the company and said, uh, pr please prove to me that the interest that you're charged from or, or paying to or from your related party is an arm length or something like that. And then what you normally do is you would show them, again, that was years ago, you would show them a certain quote from a bank. And you told him, you know what, uh, I uh, called this, uh, I called my banker this morning and I asked him, you know what, let's assume, let's assume I would take a million dollar loan from you, what would be the interest? And then the banker would say, you know, let's assume that I would indeed give you the loan uh, and let's assume a lot of million things. 
then the, the, the interest would be 3.4%, for example. Then uh, this guy would use that in its intercompany uh, loans, and that would be it. But of course, um, that's not enough today. You can't just quote for bank for many reasons. There's a lot of circumstances. You have to check securities. Uh, the, the bank actually didn't give you the loan. It just said theoretically what would happen. Uh, you have to take, uh, you have to check, like it says here, restriction, uh, payment history, taxpayer disposition, ability to look at the loan, a lot, a lot of things that you have to convince the tax authority that indeed you are doing the right instrument and you are providing the right arm's length data in order that uh, the name of the instrument, whether it's debt or equity, would be characterized uh, well. And as you can see in this slide, that uh, generally the basic canina threshold factor to consider is whether there is a written unconditional promise to pay on demand on the specific date of some certain money, and whether there is a subordination or preference to any uh, identity of the corporation, uh, the ratio of debt to equity, that's also called thin capitalization, uh, hopefully we can have the time to touch that, uh, and the relationship between holding of stocks in the corporation and so on. So, uh, like the OECD, or I would say quite the opposite, the OECD right now also describe these terms in order uh, to classify right your debt and equity as the US regulation uh, also uh, do. Uh, we can move to the next uh, slide, please. Okay, so uh, the question uh, uh, right now is basically how to estimate the cost of debt of intercompany loans. So basically, again, we're not using banks anymore and things like that. This is quite a process. If you want to do it the right way, it's quite a process. First of all, we start with an external cup. Cup, of course, stands for a comparable uncontrolled price, or like the cap, comparable CUT and comparable uncontrolled transaction. Uh, basically, um, we are checking whether the amount charged for a controlled transfer of funds was arm length by reference to the amount charged with the comparable uncontrolled transaction. And in order to do that, this is part of a transfer pricing study which touch only intra-company finance, we have to know the following factors, the borrower credit rating, again, I'm talking about now intercompany, the borrower credit rating, the duration of lending instrument, the embedded convenience, and the lending currency. Let's go to the next slide because of time pressure, please. Okay. So step one would be the loan duration. In order to evaluate the loan's cost of debt, the first step will usually be a duration period estimation by using a certain thing called the Macaulay duration formula. We will not get into that, but it's very important to use that because in the end of the day, we have to find the weighted average time until the loan or bonds, depends what we're testing, cash flow are paid. So, uh, why is that important? Because interest yield rates are positively related to the terms of the lending instrument. We are doing here actually in combination, we're using certain databases, and we're doing combination between examining intercompany, uh, sorry, uh, third parties agreements of loan. So one uh, company gave the loan of some certain financial institution get grant a loan for another, what would be the interest and what would be the terms? Uh, and we're trying to see if that fits our case. That's the external cap. But we're combining that also um, with interest yield rates uh, uh, from uh, bonds that we can see that in the next slide. Okay, next thing and maybe most important, like the heart of the things, is the credit rating. Credit rating, of course, uh, we have to see uh, if it is, a, it is a rating given to a particular entity based on the credentials and the extent to which the financial statements of the entity are sound. In other words, uh, we, should, we are checking the history, we are checking the financial statements, especially the balance sheet, and we are checking what is happening with this credit rating because, of course, the better the credit rating would be, the lower interest uh, we can use. Um, but because we are talking transfer pricing, this is a very important point to consider. Because we are talking about the transfer pricing, we are actually using a range, like there is an interquarter range, uh, you know, for the TNMM and CPM and stuff. 
Here we are using a range in order to create the credit rating. So if you can see down there, we can see um, the investment credit range that uh, differs between the upper uh, three A's and the lower B, B, B minus, which reflects a relatively high level of credentialness. When we have an upper B, B plus and lower D, which is a low level of credentialness. And that credit rating is very, very important in order to determine what would be in the end of the day, the arm length interest. Um, so uh, that's the second thing uh, that uh, uh, we are doing. Of course, we're applying uh, various credit agencies like this S&P Standard and Poor's and Moody's uh, and Fitch rating. There's a formula there, but uh, usually uh, because uh, it's not uh, always identical between all of them. So we are using, at least for transfer pricing purposes, as I mentioned, a certain uh, range. Let's go please to the next slide. So, um, uh, this is the uh, stage three, the yield curve uh, benchmarking. So, now what we're doing is uh, we are structuring interest rate or yield that can be uh, depicted as a plot of cent of interest rates on bonds of different maturities or duration. And we are combining them with the results, for example, refined from using agreements of loan. So this is a very important, this table there, we don't have time to really go into it, but of course we can be answering questions uh, through the email. This is a very, very important analysis because that's the accurate way to finding what would be the right arm's length interest. Um, so as you can see there, the data, in order to construct an appropriate yield curve for the following parameters, we should be considered the currency. Of course, what's the currency of the intercompany loan agreement, what we are using and what's the agreement that we were reading. Uh, the industry, very important to use, like in transfer pricing, other studies, SIC code. SIC stands for Standard Industrial Classification. It's very, very important to use that because every industry has its own data. Uh, you can't compare the risk of an IT, for example, of risk, uh, for example, of food, or risk of financial instrument, uh, or things like that. And uh, credit rating, we already discussed. We also have to find out what's the interest and maturity fixture according to the intercompany loan agreement, what's the uh, specifically loan specification, and that takes actually to read the, inter the, sorry, to read the agreement. So we are reading the agreement and we see the special specification and we are comparing them to our situation. And finally, the intercompany loan agreement, the loan's effective date, basically we are talking about the date of the loan, or in the absence of written agreement, the date of funds that were initially extended to the borrowing entity. Um, let's go to the next slide. All right, so I will not get into that, but this yield actually, uh, it was taken from uh, the financial Bloomberg, a very important uh, uh, famous instrument. As you can see here, we can see an yield curve constructed by fitting observation into a certain curve. And in the end of the day, if you can see the table there in color, it's very small, um, but I have the yield, I have uh, the duration of the loan, and in the end of the day, all these parameters are allowing me uh, to get the arm's length interest rate. Okay, let's uh, move to the next slide, lead. All right, so we are basically uh, uh, five minutes uh, before the end, so we will skip uh, uh, the example, but of course uh, you will see the presentation to illustrate the mezzanine loan, uh, but I would still would like to uh, say a word about, uh, about the, the, the factoring transaction. So if we can go straight to that, please. Okay. Um, so, uh, what right so we are see right now about the the factoring uh, uh, transaction um so uh hold on yes so i i would like to just to give an example all right so uh let's say that in the end of 2018 a certain distribution lc desired to attend a certain cash injection from again a related party not a third party in the form of a non-recourse non-recourse meaning that uh, the factor is responsible for the risk, a counter-receivable factoring transaction, which the company, again, as we illustrated, sells its outstanding account receivable related to its revenues, 
<clears throat> generated from corporate customers. No, because the customers are not paying in time. Uh, we're quite sure they will pay. There's no 100% guarantee of that, but we hope that that will happen. The vast majority of the corporate customers are publicly traded companies. In case of non-recourse factoring, the risk of non-payment by the customers of the DIST LEC is to be borne uh, by the factoring, and, the, uh, and that's what happened. So we have to consider the following things, and we will end uh, with that. It's very important. First of all, the DIST LC, the DIST LC is the company we selling its account receivable. So distribution LC will sell its outstanding account receivable balance to uh, the FFR, the foreign affiliate related party, but the market observed discount, the principal amount. The discount factor applied to determine the aggregated principal amount is calculated as a function of the default risk, which is in this case, of course, is a credit risk, for each individual customer account benchmark on an appropriate yield curve. And we remember the yield curve uh, from determining an arm link interest. The determined yields are then utilized to discount the nominal outstanding account receivable balances as a function of their individual net present value based on each account receivable, we'll see that in the next slide, remaining contractual, remaining, very important, contractual payment period. The distribution LC may be responsible for administrating the actual collection activities, the proceeds of which are transferred on a back-to-back -back basis to the foreign affiliate FR. Let's go to the next slide, thank you. So here we can see how we are discovering what would be in the end of the day in that particular factor in production, what would be in the end of the day the potential free tax profit-based profit erosion of distribution LC. And we can choose, of course, what is better for the group. So we can see that we have a column of the customer. We have its credit risk. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not very good. We have the nominal, the nominal account receivable amount. And we have the payment due date. We have how many days to payment? That all goes into the formula. Then we have the capital, the duration credit risk, which we did already before, like the example I gave, but now we have the results. Then we have the specific discount factor, this is a formula here. And then we have the principal amount, which is the nominal. And from there, we are getting to the professional free tax profit based erosion of distribution LC. And then the group CFO, for example, and the group secretary. And legal advisor can, and tax head of tax can sit together and say we choose the right way of doing the pre tax profit based erosion of our distribution LC according to real arm's length data, and we have that document. So that was example how to use uh, a very special instrument in factoring, um, but that goes, of course, to all intercompany uh, finance. Um, and that's basically ends our time. Arena, do we have uh, any question here? Um, no, we don't. Um, uh, not so far. Nobody posed any question during the slide. So okay. for the sake of time, um, I'd like to thank you, Yarif and uh, Donna as well. Thank you both. It was a very instructive, very informative uh, webinar. It was very interesting. Um, you guys attendees can reach us uh, via email. Please feel free to drop your questions. The webinar recording will be live at TPA website. So also feel free to share and uh, watch it again. But uh, I think that's it. Uh, any final remarks, Gareth? Um, no, I think again, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about it. It's very hard for us to contain everything uh, in uh, one hour. I think the important thing here uh, that we learned today is, first of all, uh, that intercompany finance are not uh, as less uh, uh, important than any other intercompany transactions. And the example that we gave out to analyze very, very, again, very and too much briefly, I'm not getting into the numbers and details, is just to illustrate uh, that you cannot analyze your intercompany finance today but just by writing something or comparing to a certain bank or just explaining something. You really need to do a very, very important and going into detail analysis. And the other things uh, that uh, the other thing that we discover and learn today 
is that we are certainly uh, in the crisis time of uh, the coronavirus, the COVID-19, uh, and we have to balance between keeping our transfer pricing policy and the commentation and implementation, which is very important, but of course, with uh, the current facts and circumstances and to adjust in the right way. I think that's the important lessons uh, from uh, today. Very well. Yeah, I uh, totally agree. Thank you so much, everyone that joined. Thank you, Yadif. Thank you, Donna. I hope to Thank see you, you all much. again in another webinar. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.